All righty. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to today's episode of the Healthy Shipworker podcast. Today, I've got the lovely Alex Stewart from Low Tox Life uh, talking to us today, uh, all about on how toxins in our food, our personal care and uh, cleaning products are actually causing havoc on our hormones and our health and what we can do to actually help mitigate um, this type of exposure. Now, Alex Stewart is an educator and change agent who founded Low Tox Life way back in 2010 after seeing um, the lack of transparency in our food system, personal care and cleaning products. She's built a movement that's a non-judgmental and positive uh, and says that her low tox peeps, peeps are a force to be reckoned with. I love that. I love that you created a bit of a movement there. Um, she's a column, uh, columnist for Wellbeing Magazine, and she's also a sought after speaker and consultant to businesses committing to change for good. So I would like to, well, uh, shout out a warm and fuzzy healthy ship worker. Welcome. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. And I just, I really appreciate you, Audra, bringing um, the idea of what a low tox life might mean to a shift worker, because as we know, uh, in shift work, we're going against the fundamental circadian rhythms of our world, you know, go to bed with the sun, uh, go to bed with the, the rising of the moon and rise with the sun and there are some additional challenges there. You guys need to look after yourselves better than anyone, I would say, because there's a mitigation aspect to um, to it. And I don't say that to stress people out from the get-go, but it's like we are a really um, amazing group of people. I mean, to put mm. your hand up for shift work is to serve you know, you might be serving in the middle of the night on a highway to create better roads. You might be in a hospital delivering babies or assisting. You might be assisting in surgery in an emergency ward. Um, I could go on. This is incredible work. And so we need to look after you guys. Mm, absolutely. Thank you for giving that little bit of a shout out to to the audience. I've always thought that it does take a very special person to be able to work these hours. A lot of people could and would not do it mm. um, for, for so many different reasons. And yeah, and the reason why I really wanted to bring you on to the podcast to have a chat, as you've already alluded to, it is unfortunately uh, sleep and circadian that disruption to our sleep and circadian rhythms is a a hormonal disruptor it is what it is uh, and but but parking that sort of aside for the moment um yeah i really wanted to dive down your area of expertise um that might help to open the eyes um of our listeners to give them a, a different angle to approach to help with that um hormonal mm. regulation so i guess before we launch into it um could you uh, share with us a little bit about your background, Alex. Like, what what actually drove you to um, set up the, your your organization and your company, Low Tox Life? So, one of the things that's great about getting older is you start to see common <laughs> threads in your life, and mm -hmm. and things that thread what seem to be completely different career choices, all with similar themes. And my theme in my life has always been this desire to help someone see how easy it could be to experience something better than where they currently are and helping them with that journey. And I've done it in retail. I've done it in hospitality. I've done it in cosmetics and beauty. Uh, I've even, you know, done it uh, in teaching, training, coaching, consulting since, gosh, I think I've worked for myself since 2006. So um, that has always been the common thread for me. Uh, underpin that by some health challenges that were largely solved and opened me up to this world where you could actually give the body what it needed to feel well and it would start just doing that job. Um, I thought, gosh, you know, I really thought that once I became antibiotic resistant uh, in my tonsillitis, chronic tonsillitis picture, that was it. Like, what were we going to do next? We'd have to operate. I'd have to be gone. Um, but a naturopath showed me, actually, uh, you're missing out on, you know, you don't have enough zinc. That means your immune system and gut don't have what they need to function properly. So mm -hmm. let's pump you full of a bit of zinc for three days and really just 
um, get that immune system back online, some vitamin A, D, E, and K. We talk about those fat-soluble vitamins that are so key to immune operation as well. Uh, and some vitamin C, good old antioxidants, and boom, I was better. I didn't need an antibiotic, actually. And I'm not saying there aren't they, they, there isn't a place for them. They are a life-saving, yep. essential medication, but they are used in non-essential cases in mm. way too many situations. So um, that really shifted my perspective on... Um, how I would build a health team. And I realized, actually, I want my conventional rule out all the bad stuff crisis person um, really not feeling well. Can we run a bunch of tests? But I also wanted that person who understood what the plugins for health were uh, to help me keep my insurance plan, like the real insurance plan, which is what we put in and on ourselves and surround ourselves by in our home. That's our number one insurance plan. Nice. Um, healthy and in order and up to date and well renewed. And so it was just this journey then in examining my food and I had to go gluten-free to reduce inflammation. That's not for everybody, but for me it was very key. Um, and in doing that 20 years ago, every processed packet of food had gluten in it. Mm. So what it really meant was I had to ditch processed food. Now today, if you get told you have to go gluten-free, you got gluten-free Oreos, gluten-free cheesy puffs, gluten-free cereal, gluten-free, all the processed stuff is available gluten-free. So you might not necessarily get the memo that the real reason you are sick and inflamed is because you're eating food that's not feeding your cells, mm. uh, processed food, junk, really, just not real stuff. Um, and so thankfully this happened to me 20 years ago because I had to learn how to cook with produce and make it tasty. I was, I'm French, so there was no way I was going to miss out on deliciousness and hitting those beautiful pleasure reward centres in my brain that we get from those processed foods. I just had to figure out how to do it from real food. And so I learned to cook and I then had to learn to bake some things for when it was birthdays and celebrations. I didn't want to miss out on that nice slice of cake on my birthday or my sister's yeah. birthday. And so it was just this huge journey. Uh, and I'm a creative person. I'm very curious. So I didn't find it hard, but I noticed a lot of other people found these things hard. And I didn't like that people felt overwhelmed by mm. healthy lifestyle change mm. and having been this teacher, trainer, motivator, educator in literally every type of job I'd had up until that point, I thought, I wonder if I could bring it to this space. And the rest is history. Mm. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. And I, I, that, that brings me into the segue actually to, I guess, first talk about the food system. Mm. Um, you said that you have swapped away from the processed food and into more home cooked uh, types of food. So what what is going on um, with with our with our foods? And and I have to kind of say to obviously shift workers, and I'm sure you would appreciate this. We are very much prone to getting sucked into that because it's a bit of a vicious cycle. We become too tired to cook, so we eat crap food, oh. and then there's that vicious cycle that goes. I around. hear it. It's a hard. Yeah. Yeah, it's a hard cycle to kind of to kind of break from. But yeah, so what really is going on uh, with, with that with our food supply? Oh, I've, I, yeah, and I, I just want to speak to having a little bit of experience in shift work. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, it, but it wasn't because I was saving lives. It was because I was slinging drinks at a nightclub, <laughs> man, managing a nightclub, and we would cash up at five a.m. We'd be finally finished yeah. and go to bed, wake up at four in the afternoon, just kind of completely disoriented. <laughs> and I did that for, I think, about three years in my mid-20s. So okay. I definitely get, and I, I think about that time, and, yeah, I did get that up and go, up and go popper on the way to work as my breakfast, and I did dunk the lean cuisine meals, the plastic pouches right there into the, um, the saucepan because it was just easy and I was the bandwidth was so low. But... My first tip here for those who want to accept a curious invitation who are very much still in that space, and I get it, it's so easy. It's a cultural norm as well. If it's everywhere, if it's on bus shelter ad campaigns and mm -hmm. in movie theatres and on the news commercials, like, you know, you think, well, that's just normal. That's what we do. 
Um, but notice how no lentil farmer is running an ad on Channel 7. Uh, no, um, so, sure, the, the meat industry has a couple of groups that help at least um, lamb get, you know, it's, yeah. it's Easter commercial, which is great, you know, because protein is such an important food source, especially for shift workers. Um, there's so much nutrient uh, density in there. Um, but generally real food, like there's no tomato commercial, these people do not have the money to put ads on. Who does have the money? The processed food companies. Yeah. And they're also therefore funding our news, mm. uh, which then you start to think, well, hold on, if they're part of the, if they're a huge whack of the news media revenue, then that's why I couldn't get a show across the line a few years ago on environmental toxins and food because who would do the commercials? Who, what, Airwick? No, <laughs> full of hormone disruptors that I would then be talking about negatively. So it's a very, you know, you, you kind of unravel it and go, ah, this is why we are all stuck in this cultural norm um, because it's been funded to become so normal and in that time we've all become so busy, which means we've had less time to teach our kids how to cook. So kids are going mm. um, into the wide world just not knowing and therefore straight into the hands of the processed food industry. I put my hand up as one of those Gen X products of the 80s and 90s that very much drank the Kool-Aid and thought, oh, how great, they've made it so easy for us. Um, but the pay off is unfortunately a payback down the line and a huge rising cost in healthcare, um, which a lot of shift workers would unfortunately be seeing the product of way down the line in crisis care. So it's big, right? And mm. yeah. And I think the first thing is to accept that our cells, our bodies need certain nutrients to convert into good energy uh, and, you know, I was just interviewing Dr. Casey Means, who's bringing out a book called Good Energy, which is all about how we take inputs, convert them into energy to live our best lives. Now, if we're taking poor quality inputs, we're going to feel poor. Mm -hmm. It's basic conversion um, situation that's going on. So either we want to bring in great stuff to convert into great energy or we're going to bring in crap that's easy and quick because mm. we've been told it's easy and quick yeah. to lose our energy easy and quick. And if there's anyone who needs a bit more energy, it's a shift worker. Absolutely. It's, you know? And so how do we fix this problem? Because it's a big one. Mm. We fix it with skills. Mm. You know, we have a whole bunch of people who think, I, I have been taught that I don't have time to do this right. I have also not been taught how to cook, so I don't even know how to begin to do this right, and it all feels way too overwhelming, so I'll stay with my old friend, processed food. Now, there's some pretty good outsource options these days. Like you could actually still outsource and not have to cook yourself and do it better. Um, I think of, you know, lots of ready um, meal products that are sort of now in the fresh part of the supermarket mm, that are at yeah. least a bigger. And so we don't want to ostracize people to think, oh my gosh, I have to do it all. Yeah. Otherwise I'm not doing it right because outsourcing, you know, I'm a busy parent with two businesses. Like <laughs> I outsource, don't worry. You know, no <laughs> one's perfect, but yeah. it's about intelligent outsourcing and upgrading those mm. outsources when we need them and really being quite well researched about mm. our go-tos so that we go to properly. And maybe the first swap is from Macca's to Guzman and Gomez. You know what I mean? Like there is always somewhere you can move from wherever you are right now to a better place with more quality inputs that are going to give you better quality outputs, which is your energy in life. Hmm. So I think as long as we understand how in bed processed food is, with advertising, with uh, the revenue stream of our major outlets, channels, both radio and TV, those traditional medias, um, then we can start to ask, well, okay, I don't need to go down every dark rabbit hole of the internet around um, 
lobby groups and, you know, I don't need to become a highly political politicized person or an activist, but what I can do is become someone who figures out how to go direct to farmer with more of the food that I eat. And my favorite thing is to just gently observe what's in your shopping trolley or your basket, how much of that is packaged in long life and how much of it would go off this week. And we want to move very gradually so that it feels doable from products to produce. Mm. And then once you're doing, and along the way, there are skills to acquire. Uh, And I'm going to be running, actually, this because it's such a huge need, I asked my Insta community the other day around um, time and money, and there was this awful report by the Kellogg CEO about how they were seeing a new opportunity to market cereal for dinner to Americans because of the financial struggle currently. Oh, and this was like, goodness. you know, that song, oops, she said what she said. I was like, oh, my God, he what? said what he oh, said. Oh, this is oh, crazy oh, because yeah. that is not a quality input. Wow. And yeah. uh, if that is where people mm. really are, and I know if you see a report like that on TV, that means there are millions of people secretly feeling like, crap, like I think I'm going to have to just have cereal because I don't have the cash, don't have the time. At least I've had something. And true, at least you have had something. Yeah. Um, but we we actually need to figure out this time and money thing and re-empower people. So I've got a cooking class going live end of March and I'll send you the link for anyone who wants because the way I cook is twice a week. And a lot of people Ooh. are like, what, so do you get takeaway? Like what, how does, how do lunch boxes <laughs> work? And how, you know, everyone's crafting these amazing lunch boxes with like a special thing that they've baked here and a special, and I'm just like, who has got time for that? I don't have time for that. I would last a week making that kind of lunch box, but you know, hot pots, leftovers of like your kid's favorite meals in a delicious hot pot the next day, boom, that's just a heat up in the morning. That takes two minutes. Mm. Um, and just really rethinking, could I double up this batch and put half of this in the freezer for next week mm. instead of making the same thing? Because we're all on a bit of a roster. One, two, three, four weeks of variety would probably be the max of what most people have. So why on earth are we making one meal at one time? Mm. Blows my mind. Why are we cutting up one sweet potato and roasting it? Why? We should be making like four and saving some for a quick frittata. You know, another one goes into the salad for a quick take take to work box. Um, And, uh, you know, why are we buying one packet of two chicken breast? Buy a whole chook shred the rest that you don't eat that night. And then you've got easy chicken salads. Like there's so many things we can do to actually get real food across the line without overwhelm and additional cost uh, that you actually start to realize it's not more expensive. It's just that we've been conned into thinking you look at two chicken breasts. I think there's about 20 bucks a kilo free range. You buy a whole organic chicken. That's about 14 bucks a kilo. Plus Mm. you get the bones to make stock. Instead mm. of having to buy an $8 pouch of stock, mm. uh, the list goes on. And I think we are so critically underskilled and unempowered that that is probably the number one block I see with this disconnect between the food system that's not working for us mm. and the food system we desperately need and how we can actually move from one to the other. Mm. I love how you've you've yeah you've thrown that out there um with the two cooking twice a week option like that's gonna prick up any shift workers ears i think oh, <laughs> I, I don't like being in the kitchen for hours and yeah, people yeah. are like but yeah, you, you know. have recipe books i thought you loved this stuff i'm like yeah. no i don't <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah we've got to find ways to make it easier and I think um yeah obviously doing something like that is is definitely the right way and I look back at uh because I'm a bit of a I'm a, um, a gen x like yourself as well I remember uh having home economics in high school uh so I missed we- out we ditched the home economics but we still had the needlework Oh, um, okay. I would much prefer to have learned how to make food, food than to learn yeah. how to make a pin cushion but yeah. anyway 
Yeah. Well, <laughs> they can come in handy. I, I had half and half, so I think I mm. did, you know, one lot cooking and one. But I'm I'm hearing that that's not real. That is really being phased out and they're non-existent, which is yeah, it's just setting up people for that uh, entrapment straight away, relying on sort of processed, pre-cooked kind of stuff. Uh, you've beautifully mm. articulated um, that, Alex, about we really have lost the skills. Um, it's just been phased out, and that hook keeps us hooked into that system, doesn't it? It, it does. It, it really, really does. Um, get, staying on that, the subject of uh, of the food. So I know that there's different apps that I use, I recommend to my clients, um, to, that they like things like uh, Yuka, uh, that they can sort of scan their, their products um, to find out what's actually in them. Mm. What, because... It, it's very hard, as you said, to kind of go jump straight into doing something like that. Mm. How do you recommend uh, for those of our listeners that are still, you know, having some kind of processed food, the idea of just of not having anything, what should they be looking for on when they look, when they read the labels? Because we're also mm. taught, you know, there, there's this focus to look on, look for calories and how much protein and carbohydrates. But I think you and I are probably going to be on the same page here. We should be really be looking at the ingredients section. Mm. 100%. What, I, I would go straight for the additives and the sugar yeah. as the number one. Oh, number two, one and two, I guess, because mm-hmm. sugar drives blood sugar issues, insulin resistance. We know a lot of shift workers are already having these issues simply because we're out of the circadian rhythm. Yeah. So if we then perpetuate that issue with high sugar product, which is so alluring, right? You are It's 4 a.m. and you are assisting an emergency ER surgery like you need that like uh, quick glucose lift. I get it. But if you had great energy, if you had great uh, regulation to begin with, you would be able to find that from mm. your natural state. Mm. And this is what we really want to try and drive more. Mm. So the h- protein forward would probably be one of the best prioritizations you could make. Um, and I get that you don't want to pan fry a steak in the staff kitchen. You probably even can't. Um, but could you run a, a few steaks or a, a few chicken breasts or, you know, even eat some cubes of cheese? Or if you're vegetarian, yeah. could you, um, you know, make some tofu veggie burgers like in a big batch and put most of them in the freezer because you can actually toast those to reheat them things mm. like fritters and, and burgers, mm. um, and that most staff kitchens have a toaster. Mm. Uh, so we don't want to put the 19-ingredient bread in the toaster We want and then put some, like, jam and butter or peanut butter at best on it. We want to <laughs> reheat a good um, protein-forward fritter. Like, that would be way better. And could you do one of your two cooks a week? Could they be um, thinking of how you can do protein-forward easily for the whole week? Mm. But back to your question around starting to read those labels, I don't want to dismiss reading labels altogether because if that's where you're at, let's figure out how we can do it better. And, yes, there are some great apps. It's pretty easy now to just scan something and get a bit of a report. Uh, I love Chemical Maze and the basicness Mm. of it because you just type in, what is 614 and what is 202? Mm. Um, And it has a bit of a traffic light system with a frowny face, a neutral and a a smiley face. So that's, that can be really easy for people. And it's a great body of work, um, albeit a bit older as far as apps go. Uh, And so, and it really is just, But, I mean, even if you didn't want to run things through an app, like use your smarts. We've been convinced that we're stupid and we need to externalise everything. But if you see a list this long versus a list this long, Mm. that's your first clue. Oh, well, Mm. this has been weighed with simpler ingredients. I actually understand what all of those are. If you see a raising agent or an anti-caking agent, they're not but a disaster. They're usually something like baking soda or, you know, something like that to stop humidity in the product. But really getting those sulfites out, getting the yeast extract, MSGs, um, mm. yeast extract is a cousin of MSG, so it's neurotoxic, neuroexcitatory kind of stuff um, that stops your ability to concentrate and focus and handle stress. 
um, and really ensuring that uh, if you are going to eat something from a packet, it's the simplest version of that. Mm. So could you switch from the LCNs to the Carmen's protein bar? you know, like as just a basic example. Now that is not glorifying the still processed Carmen's protein bar. Like I would love for then the next part of the journey to be the next step where you would either batch make Mm. a bunch of bars, freeze some, have some for that week. And to that point, we've talked about skill, right, Audra? And this is, this blew my mind when I figured this out recently was that people make a recipe once and then hit the recipe book for a different recipe the next time they want to make that thing or or the Pinterest board or the wherever they're looking. The problem with that is we never get good at cooking. We just get good at following a recipe, which if you're following a recipe for the very first time every time is super taxing on the brain and you never get good at it. You never go back and make that same thing again because you think, you know, we've been taught by Instagram that our kids need this huge variety of stuff on their lunch boxes or food needs to be so exciting and different every single week. Yes, yeah, so it true. Doesn't. It yeah. doesn't. Yeah. Get your excitement from looking out at the coast, at the ocean, or going on a beautiful hike <laughs> on your day off or having a great conversation with a friend. Food is not the only excitement in life. It is nourishment and it meets our needs Mm. and connect with wanting to do that better and it becomes a whole lot easier to actually be motivated to make the changes Mm. and to think, okay, what is the minimum amount of time I can spend doing the best job possible? Because that's really what we want when we are in shift work Mm. with a lower bandwidth than the average person. Yeah, absolutely. And I think social media has a, a obviously a big part to play with that in mm. regards to things being insta perfect. Uh, and people just look at, uh, I think, other what other people are sharing now and they just get a bit deflated thinking, mm. well, my lunch mm. never looks like that or my dinner never looks like that. Um, and it, yeah, it can be a bit of a, a vicious, uh, vicious, vicious cycle. So yeah, not so good um, from a social media perspective. Okay, so I guess the, where I'd probably want to steer uh, around now is we've obviously touched on the, the food side of it. What about our personal care products? What's going on there that also may be having uh, implications on our hormo- hormonal health? Mm. So this was a big one. And I remember being given all these gorgeous products at my son's baby shower. I was like 30 oh. weeks pregnant yeah. and I had gotten really good at the food stuff. And thought I was pretty good at um, product. You know, I had started buying things that said natural oh, uh, or yeah. naturally fragranced or with essential oils or, you know, stuff like that. But once I started looking at these supposedly safe products for a baby and started to research the names of some of the chemicals, I found two pretty concerning things. One was there seemed to be a repeat on chemicals that could affect hormones in a negative way, um, could affect our natural hormone signaling by blocking or mimicking hormones in the body. Mm -hmm. And the second was potential carcinogenic activity. Mm. So this was in baby products, Audra. And I was like, if it's in the baby products, then what the heck are we putting on the adults? Mm. I'm sure it's worse. Mm. Turns out it wasn't that much worse. And actually we just think it's fine to put it on everybody. But when I remember looking at every single ingredient on my bub's sunscreen once he was around six months old um, and found that there was one that was potentially linked as a carcinogen, so could potentially contribute to cancer in a product that's supposed to protect us from cancer. Uh, Yeah. I was like, there is something really wrong here. And I cannot believe that it is controversial to ask a question about that. Yeah. I can't believe we live in a world where that's controversial, Mm. but it is. Uh, And 15 years ago talking about that, well, my head was not screwed on right. So, uh, apparently and, and, uh, you know, yeah, it sucks to be a pioneer, but at the same time, you know, I started connecting with a whole bunch of people who were feeling, feeling the same and there's an incredible body of advocacy for more, um, products that are more aligned with nature that aren't going to be disruptive to our hormones that don't have carcinogens or byproducts that could be carcinogenic. 
Um, and one of, I'll, I'll talk about two favorite things to ditch here. One is going to be really hard if you are in the healthcare system because all of the hand washers contain them. Yeah. And this is something I've talked about with nurses who've done our courses or doctors over the years about how we can get around that. And that's mm. it's a big conversation when you've got companies that fund, like, you know, sponsor yeah. hospitals and give these sorts of things for yeah. free so their brand gets out there. Yeah. It's tricky, you know. Yeah. But uh, we know that um, sodium laurel sulfate, sodium laureth sulfate, which can be contaminated with dioxin, a carcinogen, um, are very, very common in hand wash products and body wash and shampoo anything that foams basically. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Now that's not to say all foaming is bad. Uh, green chemistry has come a really long way and there are some really amazing, far more natural, much more biodegradable uh, products these days in terms of the ingredient list. But sodium laurel sulfate can be okay in a coconut or a sustainable palm derived uh, form, but sodium laureth sulfate in the majority of commercial hand washes, shampoos and body washes is really, really bad. And both should technically not be personal care products. So a bit of sodium laurel sulfate in, uh, let's say, a laundry wash, it's a really good cleaner. It's very good at cleaning clothes. It's very good in a dishwashing powder. But on your skin, yeah. never mind the sodium laureth, the, yeah. the one that has the potential carcinogen um, uh, impact, but the sodium laurel, even no matter what it's made from, is still not great for our on skin contact. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can lead to contact dermatitis, uh, eczema exacerbation, hives, psoriasis aggravation, and it's very rare that you meet a nurse or a doctor that doesn't have issues with the skin on their hands mm. uh, from how often they have to wash their hands. And the research shows us that soap and water thoroughly used is as effective. Now, why can't we get that across the line? Who knows? But if you think, oh, my gosh, I really want to advocate for this, I really just start having some conversations. Start just asking people, how's your hand skin? I feel mm -hmm. like mine really sucks, like, mm -hmm. you know, and, like, just start talking, like, rather than insinuating that everything's toxic, it's never the great way to start a, a campaign. <laughs> um, there's elements of truth to it, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, you just want to be curious and you want to yeah. go in getting people to ask their own questions mm -hmm. and because it's awful. So at least you can, you know, we always have to think about what we can control. Yeah. There are going to be elements that we have to go yeah. with the flow in life. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If it's out of your control so far, don't worry about it. Think, what can I control? I can swap mm. my hand wash at home. Mm. I can swap my bath gel. I can just switch to a bath soap. Then you ditch all the plastic as well, which is great. Mm. Uh, and I can think about my shampoo. Now, the second thing I wanted to talk about in personal care is fragrance. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is in home products as well. So we're talking scented candles, air fresheners, air freshener plug-in systems, uh, toilet bowl duck thingies. Uh, basically anything, fabric softener, anything that has a synthetic smell. Usually uh, with most mainstream products that comes and that long lasting stickiness of it comes from a chemical group called the phthalates. And phthalates are a sticky plasticizer type of um, chemical that make things stick and last long. So it's why you, you know, you smell your teenager who's just put the link spray on before they've gone to school uh, and you can still smell them in your hair that afternoon before they've even come home from school six hours later or you made at the gym that you had a coffee with this morning mm. um, or the lingering in the staff room because someone just walked through wearing something with a synthetic fragrance in it, whether it was the fabric softener on their clothes or the perfume they're wearing. Now, um, the reason these aren't great is because they have the ability to mimic or block natural estrogen signaling in the, in the body. And I don't know about you, but I'm not a shift worker right now. I go to bed at around 10, 30, 11. I wake up at around 6, 30. Uh, I find it hard enough to balance my hormones, not 
even being exposed to any of these hormone disruptive chemicals in products, let alone yeah. being someone who uses them or on top of that, being a shift worker who's yeah. not, you know, able to naturally have that hormone um, prime time, 10 to 2 a.m., refuel and mm. reorganization in their bodies. And so we really need to be very careful of these. This would be, for me, I would say like the number one thing you could do for your health is remove synthetic fragrances from your home and from your personal care products. Mm. Uh, you don't have to buy any specific brand. We are spoilt for choice these days. So don't let anyone tell you you have to get some expensive monthly account and it's the only way to do it because there are so many wonderful businesses mm. looking after us these days, mm, supermarket sure. options that are really, really uh, great value. Um, no one needs to feel like Lotox is out of reach. Um, but if you're still using the Cuddly Fabric Softener, the Ajax Spray and Wipe, the, um, you know, all those real mainstream brands that I once upon a time used to use as well. In fact, I wanted my clothes so soft that I used the Cuddly and then the dryer sheets to back it up. Um, so, you know, don't think that I'm some yogi on a hill doing life perfectly. We all start somewhere uh, and yeah. it's a journey for everybody to try and distance ourselves from these cultural norms. So... Yeah, I think I would start by just becoming aware, um, mm. thinking, do I really need the toilet duck? Like, does it really mm. matter if our loo smells like a human for a few minutes after a human used it? Like, no, we've been told that these are huge, hideous issues and that marketers have created this brilliant product to save mm. us mm. from even a hint that we might poop in the mornings um, when actually it's no big deal. And that's life. And we don't need an air freshener on if we have a dog. Um, just brush him more outside and give him a cute little shampoo in the driveway more often if you think he's a bit stinky. Mm. Um, and trust me, it can be a great workout if you've got a 40 kilo retriever like I do. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just think we have been sort of convinced that we have all these, pro oh, yeah, my towels aren't soft enough. Yeah, I mean, it's a towel. By the time you've used it once, it'll feel exactly like a towel that had fabric softener treated with it. And if you really want it, you know, my first book has a ton of super cheap DIY options that are very, very quick because I'm not a natural homesteady type person. So it has to be quick and easy if it's going to work for me. Uh, and mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's, it's, it's doable. But you mm. definitely, if you start there with your personal care cleaning and home, that'll be an amazing transformation of how much stress you are putting on your body on the regular to try and figure out what to do with all these extra chemicals that mm. we do not need. Mm, I love I love that. It is. It's all about um, starting small, those mm. micro habits to, to start to make a difference because otherwise it does, it becomes way too overwhelming. And, yeah, we spend, whilst we do spend a good portion of our life at work in an environment yeah. that we don't have, the opportunity to change, uh, but certainly starting at home from home, mm -hmm. you, yeah. yeah, you must you think about how much uh, um, reduction on your liver and kidneys and so forth you're going to be doing just by doing that. Um, so that's great. And uh, again, I, I again my my ears pricked up when you say the words quick and easy. Again, for shift mm. workers, that's a a, a really um, important thing for them too because we are sort of so stuck in um that vicious cycle so yeah i'm yeah fascinating topic and we could probably talk for hours on <laughs> on this forever but of course i'm a bit mindful of, of your time on this but i i guess is there anything um before we sort of we're just kind of looking at wrapping up shortly is there anything that uh that uh, before we go that you that I haven't sort of asked that you think that um, would be um, helpful for our listeners any like top three strategies uh, of, of, obviously you just mentioned about starting with the personal care products but any other top three suggestions even from a food perspective or anything that that would would help them to alleviate that that um, toxic load that is without a shadow of a doubt, having an impact on their hormones, um, whether it's um, acutely or chronically uh, over time. Mm. So my number one is when you do cook, can you cook double? Mm. Because every time you do that, 
will be another time you've saved yourself time, but it's also another time that you're maybe not going to have to resort to something dodgy. And yep. frankly, I don't care if you have to heat that up in the microwave because I know what staff rooms are like. Yeah. Um, yeah. It is better to heat up something from home that mm-hmm. was scratch cooked than mm-hmm. it is to get Maccas. Um, so you will always be way ahead of the game. Don't worry about the granular and the tiny little uh, yeah. issues, yeah. Um, say, with microwaving something. Just obviously don't do it with a plastic film because we, yeah. we know or in a plastic container, like mm-hmm. could you at least switch to glass yeah. um, for the hormone disruption perspective, yep. like yep. hit yourself up with some Pyrex, either buy them yourself or ask for them for Christmas, like a nice little pack. <laughs> Um, not sexy, but excellent. <laughs> Great choice of gift. Or birthday bags it's Christmas yeah, and time away. <laughs> I know. My second is those hormone disruptive fragrances. Just slowly but surely just mm. think, do I need a scented candle that cost me 30, 50, 50 bucks? No, I don't, especially now that I know that the way they got the apple and cinnamon in there is not apple and cinnamon. It's a factory produced, chemically manufactured uh, yeah. synthetic fragrance that's messing with my hormones. Yeah. Yeah. It can go. Um, and the third is something we haven't talked about today. Um, and I'm certainly not saying it to open up a new, like, you know, let's talk about it for the next 20 minutes. But if you notice any water damage or mould in your workplace because a lot of shift workers work in fire, uh, health, SOS, crisis, uh, and a lot of these places are very underfunded in terms of upkeep, maintenance, and um, the actual safety of the building, Mm. Uh, then report it to your boss and demand testing of the air because that is completely within your rights to say, you know, oh, actually my sinuses have been a bit stuffed for months now and everyone seems to have this cough at work and we're trying to figure out why. Uh, it might not be because of a virus. It could be because of mould and a lot of public health and public spaces, um, never mind the private ones, uh, but I have, I do coaching and I've had three fireys in the last two months um, saying, you know, like the way they fixed it, was that right? And I'm like, whoa, that's making you very sick. So if you feel like the space you are working in and showing mm-hmm. up to work in is not just making you unhealthy because there's an air wick plugged into the, <laughs> the bathroom, like, yeah, sure, that is an issue. But if you notice on the panels up in the ceilings, water damage or visible mould, uh, please shoot that whinge up the line and demand air testing to see if you guys are actually working in a safe space because it's very hard to look after your hormones and your health if you are breathing in poisonous air from water damaged moulds. And so I bring that up because every post office, every hospital, every um, a lot of the um, radiology places, uh, just I always look up because it's what I do <laughs> yeah. and I see water damaged panels Mm. and so I just wanted to flag that as the last thing Mm. because we can do all these amazing things for what we're eating and what we're putting on our skin and we can dish the scented candles but if you're then in a poisonous environment Mm. that is definitely a red flag as well so Mm. that that would be my top three Mm. yeah great and yeah, as you said, that kind of opens a can of worms for a completely different discussion uh, when it comes to mould. And uh, I guess I'm kind of looking at things a little bit differently now on that topic um, in regards to is the mould, uh, again, it's a chicken and egg approach, is it the mould that's the issue or is it the chemicals and that that's been um, sprayed on the wood or the the paint and everything mm. that's when it, as soon as it gets damp, it's giving off those, you know. Oh, yeah. Off. Well, we now know that yeah. those mainstream mould-killing bleach products yep. kind of act like a half course of antibiotics, which, yeah. you know, I, I use that analogy because most medical yep. professionals go, oh, yeah, you never have half because it doesn't actually fully get rid of the thing. 
These things do not fully get rid of the mold spores. In yeah. fact, they give it a food source. They often make it grow back stronger and they often grow back in a retaliative way, yeah. um, spraying off more um, anicobacteria and mycotoxins, which are the things that then end up making people sick. So you never want to try and kill mold. You want to remove it. Yeah. Uh, and if your workplace, all they had to do was just, you know, replace a few of those panels because there'd been an aircon leak and they were just contaminated now and you needed new ones, much better solution than trying to deal mm. with mold. So think remove, don't kill. That's, mm. you know, that's the thing. But the first step is testing and a lot of public places um, where shift workers are mm. um, are not okay. And mm. so I always like to bring it up whenever I have the opportunity because a lot of people just see mold. We've culturally just thought it was annoying. Um, yeah. Oh, yuck, it stinks. Oh, yeah, you know, it's gross. It looks ugly. Um, and so it's about trying to just make it look better. You paint yeah. over it or you bleach okay. it. But, you know, especially if it's water damage, has the fi- leak been fixed? Has yeah. the roof yeah. been fixed or yeah. the air con been fixed? And then beyond that, mm. what building materials might need replacing so that it's not contaminating our air. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, exactly. Guarantee you yeah. that neurosurgeon operating on a brain for eight hours, breathing in mouldy chemicals, mm. um, is going to have an element of brain fog. Now, mm. how much depends on the individual. Mm. Um, and I'm not saying this to freak everybody out. It's like, oh, my God, is my neurosurgeon healthy if you need one? <laughs> um, but it is to say, like, we should, it's not just about products. It's mm. about that, like, where are we and is it friendly here? Is it is it helping us thrive? Mm. Um, and with the public funding pressures being what they are in our healthcare system and in our fire departments, um, we know that we might need to advocate at a grassroots level for a bit more attention in that space. So that's where I wanted to to finish there. But I've got a ton of resources on mould. I'll share a link that will help you kind of anyone who's curious about it um, know what they can do. Yeah, great. Excellent. Thank you. I can tell that there's a bit of passion there on this topic. (laughs) There sure is. It made me very sick. It was the last piece of the puzzle for me. And uh, and I I think there's so low literacy because there is no rights, there's no medical establishment, medical establishment diagnosis that you can Mm. get taken through with a GP. Mm. Um, and you're dealing with either toxicity or allergy mm. or inflammatory process or a combination of all three. So it affects different people differently. And the, the, the um, I guess the overlap is safe environments. Yeah, yeah. That, that's good for everybody. Absolutely. Having that healthy, healthy place to work as well as mm. our home. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, thank you. Yeah. So much, uh, Alex. I've, I've definitely um, certainly picked up a few little hot tips on this discussion. <laughs> so, and I'm sure that our listeners um, will um, have as well, but how can they get, uh, for those that are wanting to learn more about your work, I, I know that you've have, you've written some, some books, you've got courses. Uh, I know you do a bit of public speaking and so forth. How can they get in uh, contact with you if they're wanting to, to learn more? Well, Lotox Life is trademarked. So anyway, you see Lotox Life, those words exactly as they are, yeah. that's me. So okay. the podcast, <laughs> uh, Instagram, Facebook, you name it, that's that's how you'll find yeah. me. Mm-hmm. I didn't trademark Lotox back when I started it because I really did think that that was a movement. I thought the idea that we could just lower our toxic load was an approachable term that I wanted people to use. So if you yeah. see Lotox... Uh, farm or low-tox mama or low-tox fiery or da, 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 it, I can't say that that is information that I have checked um, because people have used that term in lots of different ways. But low-tox life is me and us and through the courses, books and anything else that you need, the podcast, you know, we're nearly up to 400 shows. Um, there's tons of information to support whatever you whatever you fancy. Yeah, brilliant. Excellent. Well, I'll make sure to pop those links in the show notes um, at the bottom of the uh, podcast. But yeah, so thank you so much for for joining me today, um, Alex. As I said, it's been a you've been been on the back of my mind as to is to get you on because it's such a huge uh, area of um, 
uh, such a massive topic, but it's not spoken about enough. And I think it's it's about thinking outside the box a little bit in different ways, that holistic big picture approach on how we can take care of our health and and definitely everything that you're doing certainly um, yeah, epitomises that. So, yeah, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me, Audra. And to all the shift workers out there, thank you. Whatever work you're doing, uh, <laughs> a, a lot of the times we don't get to see it and celebrate it, but you're amazing humans. Mm, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Definitely. Well, thank you so much for joining us on today's um, podcast. That's um, the another episode. Uh, if you feel that it was beneficial for you, please go ahead and leave a review or a comment as that really does help me to reach more people uh, just like yourself uh, all around the world. Until next time. <laughs>